require discussions with the uh, contract winner. We're in the process now of coming to financial close, and it's during that process we can have the discussions with the contractor to see which parts of the project may be brought forward. And, of course, top of that list would be the, the airport and the Dice area. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what engagements he has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Uh, engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Joanne Lamont. Thank you. Presiding Officer, yesterday the Governor of the Bank of England said, and I quote, uncertainty about currency arrangements could raise financial stability issues. The First Minister isn't getting his currency union, an option which Jim Sill has called stupidity and stilts, and is now implying he will use sterling without agreement. John Swinney hints at a separate Scottish currency, while Dennis Canavan specifically backs one. His own former adviser, Professor John Kay, says it would be stupid for the First Minister not to have a plan B. So when Mark Carney talks about confusion with the currency, can the First Minister tell us where that confusion could be coming from? First Minister. Well, I, first of all, let me say I, I welcome, uh, Order. I welcome Mark Minister. Carney's uh, statement yesterday. Uh, I think it was a very effective statement to calm the uh, financial markets and speculation. Uh, and I think we should be all appreciate the fact that the Governor of the Bank of England, fulfilling his responsibilities, made clear that these, uh, these duties of the Bank of England would be fulfilled. I think that was excellent. Secondly, I also welcome the fact that he reiterated yesterday uh, that the suggestion by some in the No campaign that he was against the currency union was not true, that he had not said that. He's reiterated that I know a number of times. The Bank of England, quite properly, is neutral in the matter and will implement uh, the proposals that are agreed. Now, thirdly, Joanne Lamont uh, asks where uncertainty comes from. Might it be because that the United Kingdom Westminster parties seem to have a vested interest in causing as much uncertainty as they possibly can. <laughs> and if that isn't the case, why, of all the subjects where they said they would not pre-negotiate, why has the combination to rule out the proposal for a currency union come from? Was that not about trying to create uncertainty? Yeah. And thankfully, yes. and welcome the fact that the Bank of England Governor has moved to, to put an end to the Unionist campaign's plans. Yeah. Joanne Lamont. Ms. Lamont. You know, the First Minister, as usual, may impugn the motives of the Westminster parties, but it's not the leaders. It's not the leaders of the Westminster parties that the women of Scotland are describing as dishonest. They also describe him as arrogant and they describe Nicola Sturgeon as ambitious. But then we knew that last week. We knew that last week. And when the First Minister, the First Minister needs a reality check because he welcomes a statement, but he doesn't listen to what the statement was saying. So let's look at what was actually said yesterday. The Governor of the Bank of England made it clear that a crucial element of sharing a currency is sharing fiscal risk. He said there needed to be, and I quote, some form of fiscal arrangements. In response, the First Minister told Jackie Bird last night, what we will control is 100% of our fiscal policy. That is simply not true. No, we wouldn't. Mark Carney says we wouldn't. Isn't the First Minister deliberately misleading the people of Scotland on the fundamental issue of the currency? First Minister. Uh, well, f firstly, in terms of the, uh, the, the suggestion that I made that uh, the Unionist parties were trying to create instability, uh, can I cite uh, Professor Anton Muscatelli, Muscatelli, the principal of the University of Glasgow, a uh, quote in terms of uh, an article in the Financial Times, the most damaging prospect to the rest of the UK from rejecting a sterling currency union is it will do to its own trade and business activity. Whatever the political tactics involved, it will be tantamount to economic vandalism. So it's not just the yes campaign that detect from the behaviour of the no campaign a deliberate attempt to create uncertainty and fear that academic observers who is uh, impartiality in these matters and commentary cannot be impugned, detect exactly uh, the same thing. Uh, as, as far as the salvation polls concerned, 
I suppose we have a, a, a sort of a chance and opportunity each month uh, to look at the Salvation Poll and to, to find out what didn't seem to, for some apparent reason, get into the record poll. And I think the answer this week might be in page 10, because the poll asked the voting behaviour of the 1,000 women uh, that they polled. Uh, they found that the Scottish National Party could expect 43% support uh, from the women polled, the Labour Party 27%. I have to say, many people, many people consider it to be unlikely that the SNP could ever repeat the landslide of 2011. According to the Salvation poll that Joanne Lamont seems to be so pleased about, the SNP support among women over that period has increased. Yes. The Labour support has declined. And on the basis of a poll, and it only is one poll of women voters, but a very, very important part of the population of Scotland, then if there was an election now, the SNP could expect to have even more members and the Labour Party considerably less. Joanne Lamont. And I wonder why people call the First Minister arrogant. He didn't answer the question he was asked on a serious question of the currency. The First Minister quotes one person. I would be here all day quoting all of those independent experts who say his lack of a plan B is creating grave, grave uncertainty for families across this country. John McFall, former chair of the Treasury Select Committee... <laughs> Forgive me. Order. Forgive me. We're only, allowed to, we're only supposed to quote people who agree with the First Minister. But sadly, sadly for the First Minister, in a democracy, the rest of us are entitled to an opinion. So John McFall, former chair of the Treasury Select Committee, and quote, and I said, Governor Kearney was asked specifically about the potential of capital flight in the event of independence and said he has contingency measures. He continued, it's clear that the Bank of England is putting plans in place to prevent a run on Scotland's bank that would be caused by Alec Salmon's, that would be caused by Alec Salmon's complete failure to set out a credible position on currency. This would put the livelihoods of millions of Scots at risk. Does the First Minister care that his plans for separation could lead to the devastation of the Scottish economy? Or, or, or is Andrew Large, the former Deputy Governor of the Bank of England, right when he describes the First Minister's currency plan as a huge deception? First Minister. Well, I, I think rather than quote uh, John McFall, estimable man though he is, uh, but a Labour politician about what Mark Carney said, why, why don't we quote Mark Carney di directly? Yes. I welcome what Mark Carney had to say yesterday because he was fulfilling his responsibilities yeah. in an impartial way as Governor of the Bank of England to calm financial markets. Now, Joanne Lamont seems to suggest that all this uh, uncertainty has got nothing to do with the Better Together campaign, and she didn't like the quote from Professor Anton Muscatelli, the principal of Glasgow uh, University. Then perhaps shall we take a quote from the Better Together Zone website. The people who, of course, have no interest in creating instability, <laughs> no interest in fear-mongering, no interest whatsoever in project fear. The Better Together website says, financial market speculation could lead to capital flight and higher interest rates. Ultimately, if markets weren't calmed, Scotland would have to adopt its own separate currency in time of crisis. You and the Better Together campaign are involved in trying to create uncertainty. Yes. They tried to create uncertainty on inward investment, but unfortunately that has moved to an all-time high since 1997. They tried to create uncertainty on jobs, say that jobs would be lost because of the referendum. But what we've found is we now have a record employment yeah. in Scotland yeah, exactly. and record women employment in Scotland. And just as the attempts on inward investment and jobs failed, so the attempts to try and generate instability in the financial markets will fail as well, thanks to the resolute intervention and action of the Governor of the Bank of England, the person charged with the responsibility who has fulfilled that responsibility, and I welcome Mark Carney's intervention.
Joanne Lamont. This minister has to understand his prospect is of independence without knowing what the currency is, is what creating uncertainty. <laughs> and only the First Minister, only the First Minister would blame those who point that out to him as being those who are causing the uncertainty. Because for the rest of us, we want the best option for the people of Scotland. Keeping the pound. Order. Keeping the pound. Order, Ms. Lamont. Keeping the pound in a currency union with economic stability and political representation within the United Kingdom. That's the best option. That's why the majority of doctors, the majority of women, the majority of people of Scotland are proudly voting no to protect families across this country and in the future. Now, the Governor of the Bank of England was answering a question about savers taking their money out of Scottish banks and investing it, in it, investing it in other countries because Alex Salmond can't tell us what Scotland's currency would be after a yes vote. Mark Carney clearly thinks the risk is real because he has revealed the Bank of England has contingency plans for it. So before the financial crisis hits, shouldn't the First Minister... Order. You know, if it were only your own future you're putting at risk, we would expect that kind of answer. This is a risk for families and their future across the whole of the rest of the United Kingdom in Scotland. It deserves better than catcalling from backbenchers for the SNP. So let me ask this question again. Before that financial crisis hits, shouldn't the First Minister end the currency uncertainty by simply telling us what is his plan B? First uh, Minister. The, the point uh, about scaremongering ha, has been, just been made for me by Joanne Lamont's uh, uh, question. Uh, of course, we should all bow to the Labour Party's expertise on financial crisis <laughs> hitting. <laughs> And if we remember, the financial crisis was analysed by the former Governor of the Bank of England, Mervyn King, who said it was the failure of the Labour government to act yeah. made the financial crisis much, much worse. So financial crisis has brought the strongest suit of the Labour Party yeah. or Joanne Lamont. But what is certain is the Governor fulfilled his responsibility yesterday, seeking to make sure that he was doing his job, doing his responsibility and stopping the instability which I believe is caused as a deliberate campaign tactic by the yes. Unionist parties. Yes. I pointed out they said inward investment was going to be deterred. It hasn't. Jobs were going to be lost were at record job numbers. And just as these tactics have failed, so have they, well, will the tactics. John Lamont says what currency will we use? We shall use the pound. Yes. That is why we've made it clear and adamant. That is why we are saying that, not because we want to get drawn into the game of the Unionist parties in attempting to create instability. I welcome the intervention of the Governor of the Bank of England and one, another of the Unionist campaign's foxes has just been shot. Yeah, yeah. Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when he will next meet the Secretary of State for Scotland. First Minister. Uh, no plans in the near future. Ms. Davidson. Thank you. The First Minister has heroically tried to spin the Governor's words as a win for him. It's not. We're the side that's advocating the best solution for Scotland, which is keeping the pound in its current stable form. We're the side that backs our banks having a trusted lender of last resort. We're the side that knows you can't get divorced and still keep the joint account. He's the one who is throwing a hand grenade into this mix. He is the reason that the Governor is now being forced to prepare contingencies. And he is the reason why the headlines this morning are talking about capital flight and chaos. He demands independence. He claims that nothing will change. But when there's a fallout, he protests that somebody else should have to clear it up. We know that the First Minister hates taking responsibility for anything. But is he really suggesting 
that this is the fault of everybody else? First Minister. No, I, I'm suggesting it's the responsibility of the No campaign, who are deliberately yes. trying to create instability yes. as a campaign tactic. I'm not blaming other people. I'm allocating that responsibility to the really? Labour Party, the Conservative yes. Party yes. and their alliance in the No campaign. And I am applauding the action of the Governor of the Bank of England, fulfilling his responsibilities, recognising that these responsibilities continue yeah. after September the 18th. That is exactly what a Governor of the Bank of England is meant to do. But for the Unionist parties to deny, given the evidence I've quoted, that they are engaged in trying to engender fear and instability yeah. is extraordinary. Why did the Chancellor of the Exchequer say there would be no inward investment? Why did the Conservative yeah. Party say there was already loss of jobs? Yeah. Isn't the evidence that that scaremongering has been confounded just as the attempt to create instability in the financial markets will be confounded as well? Ruth Davidson. So, any officer, the issue for the First Minister is that he knows the currency union that we have right now, one that works only because we are part of the United Kingdom, is the very best option yeah. for Scotland. The stability and the security of the UK pound is trusted and understood the world over. And it's why he's desperate to salvage as much of it as he can. The First Minister's problem isn't that he doesn't get it, it's that he can't sell it. Every option that he has on the table, from a currency deal without a willing partner, to sterilisation, to an 18-month transition, to who knows what, is something that is less than we have now. And the people of Scotland understand that. Why should we settle for second best on the currency when a simple no vote lets us keep everything that we already have? First Minister. Well, I have to say, the people of Scotland watching will not believe that David Cameron government is worth keeping for Scotland. <laughs> I... So we've had very substantial evidence from the Social Attitude Survey uh, that having a sterling union is the overwhelming choice yes. of the Scottish people. We've also had... Yes, well, we're, advocating, we're advocating a currency union because we think it's in the best interest of the people of Scotland. A majority in that survey also believe that's what will happen after yes. independence, and they are right to believe that. Why are they right to believe that? Because we know the consequences of the Unionist parties attempting to keep all of the financial assets of the United Kingdom for themselves. If they keep the financial assets, they end up with the liabilities. They end up saddled with the UK's debt. And it is incredible, as we discussed last week, to believe that George Osborne or Ed Balls want to say we're not going to take the up to five billion a year that responsibly the Scottish Government have said we'll take our finance our share of the UK debt. We don't want that. We're going to saddle that on English taxpayers. The inevitable consequence of the refusal to countenance the currency union. And then we come to where people will say the uh, decision should lie. I thought when we had the Jackson Carlow manning the barricades, when we had the comment from Ruth Davidson, which we all know incidentally, went into saying she would support a currency union if it was in the best interest of the Scottish people, I thought we had an acknowledgement from the Conservatives that they regarded the vote and verdict of the Scottish people as important. Let me say to you, Ruth Davidson, on September the 18th, if people in Scotland vote for what's in the white paper and the proposals to keep the pound, that's exactly what will happen. And any Scottish politician which doesn't recognise the sovereign choice of the Scottish people will pay a heavy price. Incidentally, that is something which the Conservatives are long used to in political campaigns in Scotland. Mulroney. To ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, meetings uh, I will discuss matters of relevance to the people of Scotland. Willie Rennie. Bank of England governors tend to be cautious. So Mr. Bank of England governors tend to be cautious. So Mr Carney being open about crisis plans for a run in the banks is serious. The First Minister has, as usual, spent the last 20 minutes ducking and diving. So let's see if he can give a straight answer to this. Can he confirm that only with a vote to leave the UK will those crisis plans be needed? 
First Minister. Okay, I could do better than that because uh, the, my, uh, the Governor yesterday said that his plans were in place regardless of the outcome of the referendum uh, because that's exactly what the central bank will do and its continuing role. It makes these contingency plans to stabilise financial markets. It's really quite simple. If I could put it this way to Willie Rennie, the unionist campaign, Better Together, himself, Labour and Conservatives, are trying to destabilise financial markets. That's why it's on its website. The Governor of the Bank of England is seeking to stabilise financial Order, markets. Order, let's hear the First That's Minister. That's his responsibility. That's why people in Scotland, like myself, will welcome the actions of the Governor of the Bank of England and deprecate the politics of Willie Rennie and his colleagues. Willie Rennie. Uh, only the First Minister could claim a warning on the run in the banks was a triumph for his cause. <laughs> Yet claiming credit for a crisis he caused makes him look like the old pretender. The Governor of the Bank of England is a cautious and learned man who the First Minister has just praised. The Governor has been open about his crisis plan B. Isn't it time the First Minister tells us his? First Minister. Well, uh, of course, the, the, the Governor uh, was asked the contingency plans and said it wouldn't be helpful to spell out what the contingency plans were, because that's because he's a responsible Governor of the Bank uh, of England. But just in terms of what uh, uh, Mark Carney, when he was shooting down the fears, uh, if only really could just accept that the, the Governor has done a very effective job in stopping the instability that Willie Rennie and his colleagues were so interested in creating. Uh, but, as I said, in terms of the financial stability questions, this is the Governor, I will reiterate whatever happens in the vote, the Bank of England will be a continuing authority for financial stability for some period of time. He was making the obvious point that they would discharge their responsibilities. Now, I know that the campaign, and uh, let's all enjoy the, the next five weeks that we are going to take part vigorously, but there is a responsibility, a responsibility to, to explain to the, the people of Scotland that everybody in this chamber should be acting in Scotland's best interest. That is what this government will do. I really wish and hope that the unionist parties can bring themselves to believe that this prosperous, independent nation is well capable of independence. We have agreed it unanimously in this chamber last week. Let it be reflected in the campaign rhetoric. Question four. Christian Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reports that an independent Scotland will not be able to support the state pension. First Minister. Well, as one of the richest countries in the world, there's no doubt an independent Scotland could afford a high-quality state pension system. Social protection spending as a percentage both of GDP and tax revenues is lower in Scotland than the rest of the UK and has been for each of the last five years. I was interested in the responsible comments of the UK Pensions Minister Steve Webb, who confirmed that state pensions built up prior to independence would be continue to be paid to the people of Scotland. On the 6th of May, he said, it is what you are put into the national insurance system prior to independence. They are entitled to that money. For the first parliament in independent Scotland, existing pensioners will have their state pensions updated by the triple lock. That means their pension will increase by their 2.5% in line with the increase in inflation or in line with the increase in average earnings, whichever of those three is the highest. I hope Christine Graham welcomes that reassurance eh, as we seek to explain to the people of Scotland that yet another of Project Fear's favourite stories is based on no foundation whatsoever. Christine Graham. Well, I have to say, as a pensioner, I welcome uh, that assurance and I thank you for a comprehensive answer. However, there remains the issue of private pensions, paid now or in the future, which many pensioners fear will be under threat with independence. Does the First Minister agree with me that these are a matter of contract and payable under the terms of contract, whether in an independent Scotland, our UK or elsewhere, and that with a yes vote, well, we have an opportunity to use Scotland's wealth to develop sustainable and better pensions for Scotland's pensioners now and in the future? First Minister. Well, I, I, I think I can claim an unimpeachable authority uh, for that point, uh, and that, of course, is the, the Daily Mail uh, newspaper. Uh, there has been a, a number of speculations in that and other newspapers about the position of private pensions. And one of the Yes campaigners, who wants to remain anonymous, uh, probably because he's an ex-employee of the Daily Mail, uh, wrote to the Daily Mail pension provider asking about such claims uh, and received the following reply from the pension provider, DMGT. Uh, I can confirm 
that should there be a yes vote in the 2014 Scotland referendum, the benefits you have accrued in the scheme will be unaffected. If you have any further questions, please do not hesitate to telephone me. I think we should all telephone the Daily Mail why their own pension provider is giving the reassurance to their pensioners, which unfortunately, as yet, they are not prepared to give to their readers. Whatever the Daily Mail said, we've all read what the Cabinet Secretary for Finance said to his Cabinet colleagues when he warned that the volatility of oil revenues would compromise the affordability of pensions in an independent Scotland. Yesterday, we saw that oil revenues for last year were half what the Scottish Government had told us they would be. Doesn't that just show us how right Mr Swinney was to flag up the threat to pensions from a yes vote next month. First Minister. With uh, his unerring sense of timing, Ian Gray has managed to make that point on the, the day that Sir Donald Mackay, a 25 years advisor to successive Labour and Conservative Secretary of State for yes. Scotland, the doyen of oil economists in Scotland, has described the OBR figures as precisely wrong and produced forecasts which back the Scottish Government's assessment of oil uh, revenues. Uh, and therefore, I welcome Order. the fact that Ian Gray would wish to mention oil and its forecast. The difficulty for the Unionist parties is this apparent suggestion that oil and gas is some tragic burden on the people of Scotland, when for every other country in the world it's a substantial asset. That substantial asset will continue. And the best thing about it is, at last, the resources of Scotland will go to benefit the people of Scotland, not the London Treasury. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The official Scottish Government pensions paper has 30 key proposals, but only four of those proposals are costed. Given the importance of pensions to the people of Scotland, will the First Minister agree to update his pensions paper and put costings next to all 30 proposals. Well, I, I, I don't accept the premise of the question. The White Paper was quite specific about uh, our proposals on pension. The guarantee that pensions would continue to be paid and why they would continue to be paid, the explanation of affordability, the proposal for the triple lock yeah. and the consideration yeah of the retirement age consideration because that is an important aspect to meet the Scottish population. That has been a, a significant body of work and I suggest that the member uh, reconsults it because he will see uh, that the Scottish Government's proposals and pension give more guarantees, more assurance and above all more fairness than anything that's yeah, come yeah. from Tory Labour Government. Question five, Jackie Bailey. To ask the First Minister whether there will be food banks in an independent Scotland. First Minister. Well, we'll, we'll seek to eradicate the need for, for food banks. As one of the wealthiest nations on the planet, the powers of independence can shape a fairer welfare system and ensure that many more of our people feel the benefit of that wealth. Is Jackie Bailey aware that the Trussell Trust has seen a 400% increase in people using food banks in the last year? That includes more than 22,000 children. Yet Labour, on Sunday, suggested that when the Deputy First Minister raised this hugely important issue, she was just creating a distraction. I saw today that another well-known Labour commentator described the debate on National Health Service and independence as another distraction. If Labour really got to the point that they can't face issues like food banks and poverty in Scotland without calling them a campaign distraction, address the issue, because what it tells you is that thousands of our fellow citizens are suffering and being covered in poverty by policies of a Westminster government that we did not vote for. Jackie Bailey. Can I thank the First Minister for his response and just point out to him that rather than just talking about it, we on this side of the chamber are engaged in doing something about it. <laughs> on Monday morning, on Order. Monday morning, Order. Monday morning, Nicola Sturgeon, in an interview with GMS, acknowledged that there would be food banks in an independent Scotland. By lunchtime, she said there wouldn't be any food banks at all if people voted for independence. Isn't it the case? that countries like Ireland have food banks, 
where one in ten people are living in food poverty despite being independent, demonstrating that it is in fact a matter of political will rather than constitutional change. And isn't it the case that whilst the SNP offer vague and uncosted promises on welfare at the same time as giving tax cuts to big businesses, that Nicola Sturgeon's first answer is the right one? Sir. So are we meant to say that a policy over a period of time to eradicate the need for food banks in Scotland is criticised by the Labour Party? I suspect that's the position that the No campaign have got themselves into. Let me quote from Better Together Aberdeenshire. Quote, food banks are Scotland becoming a normal European country. Far from being a sign of failure, they are an enriching example of human compassion, faith and social cohesion. Now, everybody salutes the work of those who are going to the assistance of their fellow citizens. But are those on the yes side of this campaign do not believe that the huge growth in food banks in Scotland is a sign of Scotland becoming a normal European country. We seek and aspire to have a society where justice and fairness is at the centre of our social policy. We know that won't be implemented from Westminster, not from the current Tory government and certainly not from a Labour party which has already said it will accept the Tory party's spending plans. Has the Labour Party so far gone in this debate that you're prepared to defend the expansion of food banks as a sign of success of this union? Question six. Liz Smith. To ask the First Minister how many two-year-olds from workless families will receive free childcare at the start of the new school session? Uh, around 3,400 two-year-olds from workless families will take up their new entitlement to a free nursery place this month. Indeed, the first two-year-olds to benefit from this policy started in Renfrewshire nurseries on Tuesday of this week. In total, we expect more than 8,000 two-year-olds from workless households will benefit from the free nursery place over the course of this year, giving them a better start to their education and their parents a much better chance of finding work. Well, Smith. Uh, thank you, First Minister. I think every political party in this chamber is on record supporting improved childcare provision. But it's very clear that the Scottish Government has now had to admit that several local authorities cannot deliver the full commitment of two-year-old from workless families in the timescale that they were promised. Can I therefore ask what information process is being used to advise these parents who were expecting to access these places just now uh, what will happen uh, as to when they will get them? Well, I, I, again, I don't agree with uh, Liz Smith. She, I mean, she said in a press release of the 4th of August, claimed significant problems in six councils, Edinburgh, South Lanarkshire, Angus, Aberdeen, Midlovian and Murray. But in every one of these councils, there is not a, a lack of capacity. Edinburgh and South Lanarkshire have the capacity they need. Angus, Midlovian and Murray will be using private nurseries to deliver the places. Some councils have already done that. There's no requirement to use their own facility. And Aberdeen is using family centres. The facility is, in my opinion, perfectly suited in particular to children, to vulnerable uh, young children. Uh, Lisbeth has raised a number of issues uh, uh, concerning uh, education and her role of, uh, as education spokesperson. She said uh, uh, that the curriculum for excellence would be a curriculum for confusion. Uh, two months later, the curriculum for excellence was, uh, was successfully introduced. She doubted whether the examination diet this year would be a, a, a success. Uh, she wanted to have the two diets of exams running simultaneously. As you may have noticed, the exams went forward over this summer uh, with some considerable success. Now, I know that she's been replaced as education spokesman by the, the sunny optimism of, of Mary Scanlon, and we all welcome, I, I think, that replacement. But given that she was wrong about curriculum for excellence, given that she was wrong about the examination diet, is it not possible she's also going to be wrong in her predictions about lack of nursery places? The councils of Scotland are working hard to fulfil their statutory responsibilities, and that is exactly what they'll do. So just let's welcome this significant, substantial expansion of nursery places to the people of Scotland. That is First Minister's questions. We now move to members' business. Members who are leaving the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.